Welcome back. This series of lessons is covering the application layer of the TCPIP model as part of our course, Networks and Distributed Systems, based on the text by Jim Kuros and Keith Ross, Computer Network and a Top-Down Approach. We've been discussing email, which is one of the most popular applications on the Internet and one of the oldest. So let's pick up where we left off. Once SMTP delivers the message to the destination mail server, the message is placed in the user's mailbox. Throughout this discussion, we have assumed that a person reads his or her mail by logging into the server host and then executing a mail reader that runs on that host. Up until the early 1990s, this was the standard way of doing things. But today, Mail Access uses a client-server architecture. The typical user reads email with a client that executes on the user's end system, such as your own PC or smartphone. By executing a mail client on the local PC, users enjoy a rich set of features, including the ability to view multimedia messages and attachments. A typical user runs a user agent on the local PC, but accesses its mailbox stored on an always-on shared mail server. This mail server is shared with other users and is typically maintained by the user's ISP, although there are a number of very popular uh, mail systems on the market that are not necessarily part of anyone's ISP, such as Gmail. Now let's consider the path an email message takes from one user to another. Typically, the sender's user agent does not dialogue directly with the recipient's mail server. Instead, the sender's user agent uses SMTP to push the email message into his or her mail server. And then that mail server uses SMTP as an SMTP client to relay that email message to the destination mail server. Why the two-step procedure? Primarily because without relaying through the sender's mail server, the sender's user agent doesn't have any recourse to an unreachable destination mail server. By having first deposited the email in the user's own mailbox, any mail server can repeatedly try to send the message, say every 30 minutes, until the destination mail server becomes operational. The SMTP RFC defines how SMTP commands can be used to relay a message across multiple SMTP servers. How does the recipient running a user agent on his local PC obtain his messages, which are sitting in a mail server within the ISP? Note that the user agent can't use SMTP to obtain the messages because obtaining the messages is a pull operation, whereas SMTP is a push protocol. The puzzle is completed by introducing a special mail access protocol that transfers messages from Bob's mail server to his local PC. There are several currently popular mail access protocols, including Post Office Protocol version 3, normally referred to as a POP3, and Internet Mail Access Protocol, usually referred to as IMAP, and HTTP. POP3 is an extremely simple mail access protocol. Because the protocol is so simple, its functionality is pretty limited. POP3 begins when the user agent, the client, opens a TCP connection to the mail server on port 110. Now you notice we keep going from port to port to port. These are different connections on a physical device that direct the message to the appropriate server. In the case of HTTP, it was port 80. In the case of uh, FTP was port 20, and now we find that with POP3, it's port 110. With the TCP connection established, POP3 progresses through these three phases, authorization, transaction, and update. 
During the first phase, authorization, the user agent sends a username and password in the clear to authenticate the user. During the second phase, transaction, the user agent retrieves messages. Also during this phase, the user agent can mark messages for deletion, remove deletion marks, and obtain mail statistics. The third phase update occurs after the client has issued the quit command ending the POP3 session. At this time, the mail server deletes the messages that were marked for deletion. In a POP3 transaction, the user agent issues commands and the server responds to each command with a reply. There are two possible responses, plus OK, which is sometimes followed by server to client data, used by the server to indicate that the previous command was fine, and minus error, or dash error, ERR, used by the server to indicate that something was wrong with the previous command. The authorization phase has two principal commands, user, username, and pass password, sort of like FTP, right? If you misspell a command, the POP3 server will reply with a dash error message. In the transaction phase, a user agent using POP3 can often be configured by the user to download and delete or to download and keep. The sequence of commands issued by a POP3 user agent depends on which of these two modes the user agent is operating in. In the download delete mode, the user agent will issue the LIST comma R-E-T-R and D-E-L-E commands. All look like FTP, right? The user agent first asks the mail server to list the size of each of the stored messages. The user agent then retrieves and deletes each message from the server. Note that after the authorization phase, the user agent employed only four commands. List, retrieve, delete, and quit, although all of those are abbreviated, with except, for, <laughs> except for list and quit. After processing the quit command, the POP3 server enters the update phase and removes messages 1 and 2 from the mailbox. A problem with this download and delete mode is that the recipient may be nomadic and may want to access his mail messages from multiple machines, like yours truly. The download delete mode partitions the user's mail messages over these three machines. In particular, if the user first reads a message on his Office PC, he will not be able to reread that message from his portable at home later in the evening. In the download and keep mode, the user agent leaves the messages on the mail server after downloading them. In this case, Bob can reread messages from different machines. He can access a message from work and he can access it again in a week from home. During a POP3 session between a user agent and the mail server, the POP3 server maintains some state information. It keeps track of which user messages have been marked deleted. However, the POP3 server does not carry state information across POP3 sessions. This lack of state information across sessions greatly simplifies the implementation of a POP3 server. With POP3 access, once the user has downloaded his or her messages to the local machine, he or she can create mail folders and move the downloaded messages into those folders. The user can then delete messages, move messages across folders, and search for messages by sender name or subject. But this paradigm, folders and messages in the local machine, poses a problem for the nomadic user, who would prefer to maintain a folder hierarchy on a remote server that can be accessed from any computer. This is not possible with POP3. The POP3 protocol does not provide any means for a user to create remote folders and assign messages to the folders. The POP3 protocol does not provide any means for a user to create remote folders and assign messages to remote folders. To solve this and other problems, the IMAP protocol was invented. Like POP3, 
IMAP is a mail access protocol. It has many more features than POP3, but it's also significantly more complex. An IMAP message will associate each message with a folder. When a message first arrives at the server, it is associated with the recipient's inbox folder, for example. The recipient can then move the message to a new user-created folder, read the message, delete the message, and so on. The IMAP protocol provides commands to allow users to create folders and move messages from one folder to another. IMAP also provides commands that allow users to search remote folders for messages matching specific criteria. Note that unlike POP3, an IMAP server maintains user state information across IMAP sessions, like the names of the folders and which messages are associated with which folders. Another important feature of IMAP is that it has commands to permit a user agent to obtain components of messages. For example, a user agent can obtain just the message header of a message and just one part of a multi-part MIME message. This feature is useful when there is low bandwidth between the user agent and its mail server. With low bandwidth connection, the user may not want to download all of the messages in its mailbox, particularly avoiding long messages that might contain, for example, an audio or a video clip. More and more users today are sending and accessing their email through their web browsers. Hotmail introduced web-based access in the mid-1990s. Now, web-based email is also provided by Google, Yahoo. Yahoo is an AT&T company, as well as just about every other major university and corporation. With this service, the user agent is an ordinary web browser, and the user communicates with its remote mailbox via HTTP. When a recipient such as Bob wants to access a message in his mailbox, the email message is sent from Bob's mail server to Bob's browser using the HTTP protocol rather than POP3 or IMAP protocols. Well, that's, that's a lot to chew on for this session. So why don't we take a break now and you can kind of review what you're doing, take care of any assignments that you might have, and we will continue later with the next lesson.